Welcome to Excerpts from the Open Forum. On this program, we'll hear Mr. Harold Camping answering pre-recorded questions regarding issues from the Bible. Here's our first question. Good evening, Mr. Camping. Yes. Uh, I'd like to mention that uh, asking you a little question, which is a very short question. Can anyone who was not uh, predestined for salvation, can this person be saved, yes or no? No. Okay. Can anyone whom God had uh, predestined to be saved, is it possible in any way this person can lose their salvation, yes or no? No. Good. All right. So in other words, if somebody winds up in hell, it means that this person, regardless of their knowledge of the Bible, they would still wind up in hell, yes or no? Well, yes, that's Okay, that's okay, correct. okay. You don't yeah. have to expand. Okay. Now, here is a question. On Friday, November 26th, at uh, about uh, the end of the show, here's your statement, and you said, I quote it, it is better, no, I'm sorry, it is far better to find out I am not saved today than to find out I am not saved at Judgment Day. Okay, since the destination and the outcome is the very same because it's the fact that someone goes to hell, it means that this person was not predestined by God, and there is no way, according to your teachings, that this person could be saved. What do you mean by being far better to know it today than to find out a judgment day you're going to hell? What's, what's better about it? Well, first of all, we, you are trying to mix up uh, God's plan with our, what our what God commands us to do. Uh, God's plan, we cannot, uh, uh, wh whom he has elected and how all that will work out, that's God's business altogether. We could, you're, uh, uh, typical of, of the kind of question you're raising is uh, this idea, well, look, if I am chosen of God, then no matter what I do or how I react to the gospel or if I hear what, whatever, uh, God has, has committed himself to save me, so I'll just wait and, uh, and uh, 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 see once what God does. Now, that is, uh, that, uh, we can take that kind of a position, but that is, uh, that is not the way God uh, uh, teaches us. God tells us that we are to know what our situation is, and uh, God tells, uh, commands us uh, to uh, become uh, his child. And so we have, to, we have to enter into the program the way God has set it, given it to us, even though in the background we know that finally it will be God's perfect will that will be done, and God knows the end from the beginning. Uh, and this is all mysterious, but we don't, can never become wiser than God. And so if I know today that I'm not a child of God. I don't know whether I'm one of God's elect. Maybe I'm not. But that's God's business. All I know is I'm not, I'm not saved. And, and at least now I can uh, let God begin to talk to God about my need and cry out to Him for mercy. And I know from when I read the Bible that, that, that God wants me to do that. I know that I can wait upon him, and God wants me to do that. I don't know. What the, are these, doing these things isn't going to guarantee my salvation. That's God's business. But I, but, and so uh, I can't do this thinking, well, if I do this properly, then God will, will react and save me. That's God's business altogether. But, uh, but uh, at least, uh, in, in other words, if I know I'm not saved, then at least I can take stock of where I am and begin to ask some questions and begin to cry out to God for mercy and begin to uh, read the Bible more carefully and so on. And maybe, maybe it's God's good pleasure to save me also. That's totally God's business. Remember the, remember the people of Nineveh. Remember the people of Nineveh. They were told that... And this is an absolute historical situation. 
they were told. They knew nothing about the Bible to speak of. Uh, and they were told, in 40 days, God is going to destroy you because of your wickedness. And they sat in sackcloth and ashes and, and asked the question, maybe, maybe God will have mercy. They, uh, it did not guarantee that God would have mercy, and they had no knowledge whether God would have mercy. But nevertheless, they, this, uh, they sat in sackcloth and ashes. And the only reason they sat in sackcloth and ashes is because God uh, inclined their heart to do this. This is all very mysterious. It's, uh, it's, it's, we can't examine these questions, uh, uh, put them out on the table and dissect them and, and rationally uh, 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 put it all together in, in it because it is, it is far too, uh, far too mysterious. It's, it's, uh, God's whole plan of salvation is, is, is too complex for our feeble minds to understand. Now, here's the, uh, the second question I want to ask you. And uh, I also would like to find out from you in a very short way because I have a third question. Uh, I have often heard you say over the air, and Mr. Camping, I listen to you every day. Every day or just about every day. And uh, sometimes for a long time during the day. So I'm very familiar with your teachings. Now, uh, I hear you constantly say, those people were not saved, or these people were not saved, or God did not save some people, and so forth. But I have read in the Bible, I don't know exactly where now, but God said, do not judge. Okay? Now, before Jesus Christ died on the cross, Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Now, when he said forgive them, this them, you cannot say whether this them was only uh, a certain number of people. Because when he said forgive them, how can you say one was not saved or another since the whole thing about uh, the crucifixion and the whole thing about Christ dying for us because he said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my followers would have fought to see that I am not delivered. But my kingdom is not of this world. Well, now, excuse me. Now, the fact is, when he said, forgive them, and I uh, uh, I, I remember earlier on when I was much younger, I puzzled over that. Did he forgive uh, Caiaphas, who said it's better for one man to die than that the whole nation die? Did he forgive the uh, the priests who and the fa Pharisees who who uh, uh, brought him in uh, in uh, uh, who bound him and brought him to trial? Uh, did he forgive Judas, who betrayed him? Did he forgive, uh, uh, and so on? And the answer, no, he didn't forgive anybody who was not a child, who he had not planned to save. That's an impossibility. But you see, the, those who really brought him to the cross were not the Pharisees. It was not Caiaphas, the high priest. It was any one of us who did become saved because uh, and we don't, had no understanding that this is what was required for us to become saved, that he had to become sin for us and had to endure the awful wrath of God. We don't, we didn't know, we don't know anything about that. But nevertheless, it, it is our problem that caused him to go to the cross. And so when he says, Father, forgive them, he's speaking about all those he came to save. Uh, and and they're the only ones that he could forgive. Uh, what do you think about study Bibles? My particular study Bible came and told me it didn't know who Melchizedek was in Hebrews, yet it explains it, and as you have explained it, it's God, and that's the way I understand it. I'll tell you, if someone came to me and said, would you please uh, publish a study Bible 
with notes uh, in it concerning what you believe this said or that said, I would say absolutely not, not. Uh, the Bible should stand alone. That is the Word of God. Uh, if somebody wants to uh, make comment on what they understand the Bible to say, they should publish that as a separate book altogether. Uh, therefore, I would never, never recommend using somebody's study Bible because the problem is that you read a, an explanation in the margin of that Bible, in, in, at the bottom of the Bible or in the margin of the Bible, and then later on, you, as you're thinking about that particular passage, you re remember it said so and so, but what you don't remember is whether you read it in the text itself or whether you read it in the notes at the bottom of the page or on, in the margin of the page. And so you confuse in your mind what you heard from the Bible and what you have heard from a teacher of the Bible. It's far better just to use the Bible. And then if you want to uh, use some uh, notes, uh, find them in other books that are not the Bible. I, you know, the, the, the people in the, in the churches, the, somebody called the ministers or the, the rabbi, and what I don't understand, and I, and I like your show, and, and I thank you for your show very much, but I know of the Benedictine monks and the various orders of, of the monks, and all of these people are called brothers. So when I hear people say unto you, hello, Brother Camping, it sounds to me like a religious title. And I don't understand why you would let people call you brother. Well, you know, I don't really care what people call me. Uh, I, I am certainly a brother to those who are true believers. In the human sense, I'm a brother to all mankind. We all are created in the image of God. And so I'm not troubled by that, even though in certain uh, uh, Roman Catholic orders or uh, certain situations that may have a reference, uh, a, a, a focal point that is uh, that I would not understand. But I'm not I'm not a bit nervous about that. It's uh, it uh, certainly is. Uh, is uh, permissible insofar as I see what the Bible is saying. Oh, I, I did not mean that that you should uh, that you should feel not not that you should be nervous, but but I was thinking if you if if a new listener were driving in a car and tuning or listening at home and tuning the dial and first heard someone say brother to you. Maybe the new listener would assume that you were a religious leader. But it wouldn't be long at all, not at all, long at all, as they heard the, the conversation and the answers that are given that I'm not of the order of, uh, of a Roman Catholic order. They would know that very quickly. And uh, then they would have to say, well, we misunderstood at the beginning. You are listening to excerpts from the Open Forum on Family Radio. Mr. Harold Camping is answering pre-recorded questions about the Bible. If you'd like to hear more of Mr. Camping's teaching, you can hear and even download Open Forum broadcasts, Bible studies, and more. Just go to FamilyRadio.com and click on Audio Archives. Let's continue now with another question. Hi, Mr. Camping. Yes. In trying to determine an approximate date of Christ's birth, uh, I, I see, I agree with you that it is the first week of October, probably. And in looking at, and it was tied to John the Baptist's birth. And in looking in, in Luke chapter 1, we read about John's father, Zacharias, who is, of the course, of Abijah. And then my question is, when we look at, can you please look at First Chronicles chapter 24? 
first Chronicles. That's where it talks about the 24 courses of Abijah, or 24 courses of the priesthood, and the eighth course was the course of Abijah. Abijah. Yes. How do we do? We know how long each of these courses were, or do these 24 courses take place in the course of a year? Yes, they, each one was two weeks long. We have another passage where it speaks about, um, uh, in, in First Chronicles, where it speaks about uh, uh, 12 courses uh, in, in, another, in another context altogether, showing that the first course uh, works the first month, the second course the second month, the third course the third month, and so God shows us how that works, works out. And by that example, so when we apply that to the 24 courses, we know that each one would have been a half a month. And do you think that verse is in First Chronicles somewhere? Yes. Okay, I'll use my concordance and find it then. Okay. Thank you, thank you very much. And, you know, it's very interesting as, you, as we f puzzle over some of these questions that uh, every now and then in a place in the Bible we hardly ever expected to find it. There we find a, a, a clue or a very important statement mixed right in with a lot of things that we have no understanding of at all. And right there in the middle of it is a sentence that that uh, is just the sentence that we need to help us go on in our trying to solve a problem some other place in the Bible. That's the way God wrote the Bible. He wrote it so that we have to search it out. And, uh, and it's, it's, I often feel when I'm trying to study a verse and understand it like a detective. You know, you're, you're looking for a clue here, a clue there, another clue in some other place in order, uh, in order to try to put the whole thing together. And, uh, and uh, once in a while, with God's help, as we pray for wisdom, we do find the necessary pieces here and there and the other place. And, ah, it all fits together. God has, has, has hidden these little clues all through the Bible. My uh, question is about Luke. Uh, 3:23, and uh, you know the, the genealogy there in Matthew 1. Uh, I'm interested in why it says in Luke 23 that Jesus was as was supposed the son of Joseph, the son of Heli. You're talking about Luke chapter three, three, right? Where we have the genealogy of the Lord Jesus through marriage. And we read here in, uh, in, uh, uh, in Luke chapter 3 and verse uh, uh, 23, And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age. That's an incorrect translation, incidentally. That is, uh, it should read, uh, uh, And Jesus was himself about 30 years beginning. In other words, it's not talking about his age. It's talking about the fact that from the time he was called out of Egypt, there were about 30 years, uh, and now it was, it was at that time he was ready to begin his work as the Messiah. Uh, being as was supposed, or as, who, as, uh, as he was thought of, as being the son of Joseph. Now, that is a... Uh, like an insertion, uh, like a, uh, a comment, uh, actually uh, the, the uh, main context or the main text goes, and Jesus uh, uh, was himself about 30, uh, the son of Heli, that is of Heli. Heli would have been his grandfather uh, through Mary. Harry, uh, Heli would have been the father of Mary. Turn to uh, Genesis three. Genesis three, verse two. Genesis three, verse two. Yes. Uh, there, let's look at that. Uh, there we read. 
Uh, and the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. We, uh, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God had said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now, what is your question? Well, my question is, uh, when the serpent approaches Eve, uh, she she tells the serpent that um, we will surely die if we touch it or eat it. Now, she adds, touch it. God never said touch it. He said, if you eat it, you will die, not touch it. You're correct. Now, she's lying to, to Satan there before she even grabs the apple. Is that a picture of how mankind is going to be disobedient from the beginning? Well, you know, see, the, the very sin is very, very... Uh, Oh, it's yeah, it's it's very deceptive. We we read, for example, in James. Let, let me go back to James, where God did, uh, has language that shows the development of sin. We read in James, uh, uh, in verse thirteen or verse fourteen, every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed then when he has con when lust hath conceived it bringeth forth sin and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death you see there is a development it, it, sin begins as an intent of the mind the moment that that serpent came and spoke to eve already uh, with, with with deception in his mind altogether already eve was being prepared to sin and uh, immediately when that serpent speaks to her and and, and sa satan is speaking in through that serpent and he it's it's totally deception as he is uh, raising the question d d uh, let me see what did he say in Genesis 3, can you eat of every tree of the garden? Uh, already, sin was developing. And, and we see the reaction of the woman. She picked up on that. And, and sin began to show up in her life already. And then finally it comes to its climax when she actually takes of the, of the tree, the fruit of the tree, and eats it. That was the, uh, that was the big exposure to the fact that she had fallen into the trap, into the pit of sin. Well, we have listeners in many parts of the world, and here is a question that comes from a listener in China. China. It's in relationship to two verses that apparently seem to be contradictory. In Romans 11:26, there is a statement, and so all Israel shall be saved. In Revelation 7, which is a little later in the Bible, it says in verses 4 to 8, I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. What does all this mean? Well, first of all, uh, in actuality, these two passages are talking about s two different things. In Romans 11, God is talking about the nation of Israel, national Israel. It starts, the chapter starts out that very few were becoming saved. It indicated that most were blinded while there is a remnant chosen by grace that were becoming saved. And then... Uh, in verse 26, God went on to say in Romans 11:26, and so that is in this way, all Israel would be saved. That is that those who were the remnant would be saved, whereas the rest were blinded. And the verse before indicates that this would be the situation until the end of the world. Oh, it didn't put it quite that way. It put it this way, that as long as there was any, were any Gentiles to become saved, that is, until the fullness of the Gentiles came in, this would be the condition with national Israel. Now, on the other hand, in uh, 
uh, Re Revelation 7, it, where it talks about 12 tribes, it is not talking about national Israel. It is talking about the local congregations, which were typified by 12 of the tribes of Israel. We know that to be so because it speaks about 12,000 from each of of the 12 tribes who were all Israel. Uh, and actually, all Israel, uh, if it were talking about the nation of Israel, would have to include 13 tribes because that is the actual number of tribes that did exist. But the context shows this, as well as the that kind of language shows us that the 12 tribes are the uh, are all of uh, are, are all pointing to the believers within the local congregations, and the number twelve thousand of each of the twelve tribes is a symbolical number. It is not an actual number. The actual an actual number, of course, is far greater than twelve thousand or one hundred and forty-four thousand. But God uses the number. 12,000 or 144,000 to indicate the complete fullness of all those who would become saved. They had to be sealed on their foreheads. That is, their salvation had to be secure before the events that would follow this sealing, namely the beginning. This all had to happen before the beginning of the Great Tribulation, which began immediately after God was finished with using the local congregations to bring the gospel. So there is no contradiction between these two passages of Revelation and Romans 11. It is simply that they are describing two different aspects of God's salvation program.